Well, I like that. <laughs> Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to see you all here at the City Club. I'm Connie Schultz. I'm a journalist of more than 30 years here, and I live in the city of Cleveland. I am also a proud member of the City Club to support its century-old mission of free speech. I am honored to welcome you to the, this important panel discussion on transgender identity in Northeast Ohio. The emphasis here today is on the conversation. Best estimates tell us that the trans community represents 3% of the U.S. population. That doesn't sound like very much, three in a thousand. But if a little more than two million people live in the Cleveland metro area, that means the trans community is potentially a little over 6,000 individuals. That's almost all of Tremont. All of a sudden it doesn't sound so small, does it? Here's the catch. We really don't know the precise number because the survey language fails to account for the variety of trans experiences. There are those who are out and there are those who are not. There are those who manifest their identity externally and there are those who keep it quietly to themselves. And not all of those I'm mentioning would use the word trans to identify themselves. I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from the African-American poet Lucille Clifton. And it's been hanging by my computer desk for more than a decade. What they call you is one thing. What you answer to is something else. Our community has a lot to learn about what it means to be trans and what it means to challenge gender definitions beyond the comfort level of mainstream America and mainstream Cleveland. And that's why we are so fortunate for this panel today and for Equality Ohio and others in the LGBT and allied community who came up with this panel idea and brought it to the City Club where they knew they would find respectful consideration from Dan Molthrop, who is one of the finest civic leaders in this region. And that is my compliment to you for the year, so don't ask for a second. <laughs> Before I introduce you to the panel, let me just say that our goal is to create a safe and public space here to talk about some of these issues that have been historically difficult to talk about. Language matters, but we shouldn't let our fear of misspeaking silence our desire to understand. We are determined that this shall be a safe place here. That includes the people asking the questions. Here's our panel. Susan Becker is a professor of law emerita at Cleveland Marshall College of Law and volunteers as an attorney with the ACLU. Dr. Henry Ng is president of the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association and clinical director of the Pride Clinic and assistant professor of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Stacy Parsons is a transgender activist, vice president of the board at Margie's Hope a nonprofit helping transgender, excuse me, transgender people in need of assistance. And Darius Stubbs is a teaching artist at Cleveland Public Theater. And I correct you recently um, published some poetry. Uh, yes. Yeah. See, so Cleveland has our, we have our poets too. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you, uh, thank you all for being with us here today. And why don't we get started? And I'm gonna put away my notes now because I know what I wanna ask. We're going, to take, we're going to talk amongst ourselves here for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open up to the floor after a few announcements. We were talking, Henry, earlier, um, and two things came to mind when I, when I knew you were going to be here. First of all, can you explain to us why this is so complex uh, through your practice? And then if you would share a little bit of what you said to me over lunch about very recent media coverage. Sure. Um, so actually this morning I was at the K, uh, the... Uh, Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine speaking about these exact same issues to a bunch of medical students. I'm going to give you the exact same definitions I gave to them. There are four constructs of sexuality that are sometimes confusing or difficult to talk about, but they're generally actually very basic and simple. The first one is biologic sex. It's a sex assigned to you at birth and it has to do with your anatomy, or sometimes if that's not clear, it has to do with the chromosomes that are, make up your body and make you who you are. The second construct is gender identity. It's how you see yourself when you close your eyes. Do you see yourself as masculine, feminine, neither, or some combination of both? But that's not necessarily the way the outside world sees you, but it's how you envision yourself. The, last, uh, the, the third is gender expression, and that's the, the way you express to the outside world who you are. 
But sometimes that's not consistent with the way you see yourself. Maybe that your environment isn't safe to do that. You might be afraid that you could lose your job or your home or otherwise be threatened with some sort of real loss or harm. And finally, sexual orientation is the last of those four constructs. Sexual orientation has to do with who you're attracted to. It has to do to some idea or some respect to how you see yourself and also how the object of your desire identifies. So there are other terms like gay, lesbian, bisexual that don't always necessarily apply to people in a transgender spectrum or who are non-gender conforming. So we don't need to necessarily put labels on people. We can acknowledge those labels if they decide they fit. But if they don't, that's OK. So that's the, the, my, the, the spiel I gave to the medical students. I, I hope that was also clear for the audience here today. And uh, if you would uh, caveat here, why is it incorrect then? So often people use the word gay, even well-intentioned people, mm -hmm. correct? But that is not the correct use of the word here. It, it really misidentifies people's core identity. It confounds their attraction to actually the way they see themselves in the world. So this is that close your eyes moment when Absolutely. you're Absolutely. Got it. Okay. It is close your eyes and see who you are. And I asked you, uh, you've been at Metro now for how many years? I've been there for 14 years. And you've been doing this since 2007. And I said to you, are we making progress? And then you told me. And I said, well, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. There's a lot more visibility with the local events and the television shows and things like that. But even in most recent events this week, a lesbian couple in Michigan experienced discrimination as their child was denied health care by a pediatrician simply because the parents are lesbians. The week before that, a New, York or a New Jersey judge had to rule that reparative therapy, meaning con uh, rather conversion therapy. Tell us the difference. You, yes. you explained it to me, I even, so I even said Even I to stumble you. sometimes. But the important word to realize is it's conversion. Reparative implies that something needs to be fixed. No one in this room, no one on this panel is broken. No transgender person is broken. Conversion therapy implies that you can change one sexual orientation based on a number of different types of therapies. However, these have been debunked and shown not to be effective and, in fact, are harmful. But we are still talking about this in 2015 in the legal system, and it tells us that we still have a long way to go. Thank you. That, that is such a great summary, I think. And I, I learned, again, just listening to you, that, that I, I was saying earlier to everyone, I admit I'm a little nervous about this one. I'm not usually nervous when I'm moderating. But I, too, worry about slipping up in language, as, and language matters so much. And everybody's been very kind and patient with me, which is more than I could say for my family. So Darius. <laughs> Ouch. Darius. Yes. You, um, you have some rather big news in your own life in terms of how it is ever evolving. And would you care to share with us a little bit about what's going on with you um, right now? Well, it, it kind of um, revolves around my being on this panel. Uh, in order to be on the panel, I had to request a day off from work. Uh, so, and uh, uh, no one at my job knows that I'm transgender at work uh, because, you know, there's that that fear, um, which is kind of just based on social barometer, that I'm pretty sure that I would make, I would make things very difficult for myself if I were out at work. But in order to be on the panel, I had to tell them why, uh, why I needed to request the day off. So um, I tried to be as honest as possible without divulging any information. And actually, um, <laughs> and so I, I told them that I was going to be on a panel and I told them what the panel was about. And they said, oh, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I told them you know, I was, I was going to talk about um, the uh, non-discrimination uh, language about the, um, the bathroom ordinance and that I supported it. But that's all I said. So now, um, so there's that. This I've is a kind very of, big deal. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that, that for me it's... Um, a scary thing, but it's also uh, very positive. I actually, um, in in talking about uh, coming on the panel, um, had a, a conversation with a coworker where we talked about her uh, transgender daughter, which she has not told anyone at work, and we were able to have that connection about that. So I'm looking forward to those those ramifications of being here and trying to put the possible negative ones out here somewhere. So you basically decided that this was that important, Absolutely. your participation in this. Absolutely. That is a very brave thing you've done. <laughs> and 
I thank you for doing that. Um, we're going to be talking more. Stacy, can you talk a little bit, please, about your experience so that we can close the distance with the audience as quickly as possible? Um, for me, coming out as transgender, um, my family, the acceptance was, um, was, it was difficult for them, but for them, the, the biggest concern for my family was my son. I had a son that was about four years old, so my family had big concerns as how that my son would react, and would my son be able to accept that? So for me, me coming to, under, to transition from male to female, my family's big concern was that, so. <clears throat> what did that mean for you, to know that that was your family's concern? Um, actually, for myself, I was very, um, I was thankful that my family loved my son enough that they were accepting of me transitioning, but they also were concerned about my son's well-being and his safety and how he was going to handle my transition. That, you know, I think that ultimately they were looking out for his best interests as much as I was myself. And what year was this? I started my transition in 2004. So how is he doing now? My son is a very well-rounded 17-year-old. So, very so he's doing well, in other words. Yes, extremely. When, when I listen to both of you, I immediately am wondering, as a, as a family member or as a friend, how can we best help? What, what do you need from uh, the people who are supposed to love you? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that I think that the best thing for anyone to do for anyone that they know or are close to who is transgender is just to accept the person the way that you did before you knew they were transgender. Um, actually, for me, uh, it's been uh, really good because I have a I have a really strong ally in my dad who's sitting right there. Is he? Uh, oh. uh, Uh, you know, and uh, I'm I'm really very blessed that way uh, because a lot of transgender people don't have um, don't have the support from their family that that any human being needs to thrive and be successful in their life, and so I think that it's just important for people who have family members who uh, come out about their trans status to know that that it's it's important, just like it's important for anyone to have that, that uh, web of support uh, and family is, is the main part of that. Stacy, that, that's, that's, that's it, Daria said it. We, we're just people, <clears throat> and I think that's the key to it. We need to be treated just like everyone else. Don't treat us any different than you treated us before. And don't, I think, just ask questions if you have a question, and don't, and if, if you're an adult, d t you know, it, treat us the same as you treated us before because the kids learn from how you treat us. Mm -hmm. and, and, if you treat us and if you treat us with the same respect that we treat, we're treating you, then the children will accept us and you know, understand that it is okay. There's nothing wrong with the way we're living our lives because there is nothing wrong with the way that we're living our lives. And the children will learn that everything is fine and they're going to accept the, the, the transition of the person that they're seeing transition. And then all we want is to be loved, just like everyone else. And it's, that's the key to it, is just to be treated just like everyone else. We don't want anything special, we don't want anything different, we just want to be treated like everyone else. Susan. One of the main reasons we're here um, as a community is because of what's happening in our community right. uh, in terms of legislation. And I would love for you, if you would please, to give us a little rundown of what we're talking about right now. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Well, if you looked at the United States as a quilt, with each state being a piece of that quilt, only about a third of the states, only about a third of the pieces have any kind of protections for transgender individuals. Um, and the spoiler alert, Ohio is not one of those. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what this means as a practical matter is that a transgender person in Ohio and many other places can be fired from their job, they can be thrown out of their apartment, um, they can be denied in some cases medical care. There's just a whole litany of things, horrible things that can happen just because they're transgender and the worst part is there's no legal recourse for that. So where is there a bright spot in all of this? Well, in Ohio, there's about, I think, 15 cities now, the municipal law in about 15 cities offer some degree of protection for transgender individuals. Sometimes it's in employment, sometimes public accommodation, sometimes housing. Cleveland has actually been a leader in this area. About five years ago, they enacted ordinances that provide protections in all of those areas, and they even increased those. I see uh, Councilman Joe Simperman is here today. Uh, texting every word I say, I believe. <laughs> Tweeting. <laughs> Tweeting, well, of course. Um, and he's been one of the leaders in this effort. So a few, a few months ago, they even further um, increased the local protections by extending it to these protections. If any contractor with the city also has to provide the same level of protections in, in employment, they extended the um, so-called hate crimes law to include transgender individuals. These are really important steps, but here's the downside with the city ordinances. There are a couple of them. One is even if you put all those city ordinances together, only about 20% of the people in the state have any kind of coverage. So we're leaving 80% of the population and I assume 80% of the transgender population uh, with no coverage. Another thing is they have very uh, minor remedies compared to what you get in state or federal law, but nonetheless they're really important. So why is there the big deal in Cleveland today and what's been going on? Well, here's the thing. Sometimes to get these ordinances passed, there's major compromises. And I wasn't there when the Cleveland ordinance was passed, but I do see evidence of a compromise, and that's that there's a major exception in there. It's both in public accommodation and it's in the uh, employment section. So what these anti-discrimination ordinances are supposed to do is they're supposed to create a situation where, for example, if someone is denied service because they're transgendered or refused uh, um, a room at a hotel, that they will have a legal remedy. But what happened in the public accommodation ordinance is it includes a very broad exception. And I don't want to get too technical with it, but this is really what happens. What it means is, for example, if a transgender individual is at a restaurant, and they want to use the restroom. So you have a transgender male wants to use the restroom with the M on it or the matador or whatever thing is on the restroom door. I get so confused with those. I'm, I just wander. Me in. too. So I, I, when, when you get arrested, we'll know why. Okay, that's yeah. It could happen. It could happen. So they want to use the restroom. A transgender male wants to use the, the men's restroom. What the ordinance currently allows is the business proprietor, or one of their employees, having spent all of maybe 30 seconds with that person to assess their gender identity and say, no, I don't think you're sufficiently male to use that restroom. You have to use the other restroom. Now again, think about that. You're taking a person who's a total stranger to this transgender individual and allowing them in 30 or 50 seconds to assess the proper gender identity for this person as opposed to what anti-discrimination ordinances are supposed to do, which is to defer to the individual's choice which been, is based on a lifetime of experience and deep reflection. And if that isn't discrimination, I do not know what is. So again, <laughs> but the, the ordinance is well intended, I believe, and I believe city council is, and uh, a coalition of the willing, and these are truly willing people, not like the coalition of the willing in the Iraqi war, which was a lot of arm twisting involved, the Coalition of the Willing, a lot of uh, groups are working on this. Individuals at Quality Ohio has had a big role in it. ACLU's provided support. We're going to get this ordinance changed and take out this exception so that transgender individuals really do um, enjoy the full protection of the law and the dignity that comes with that. And my understanding is that this is going to require cooperation between City Council and the Mayor's Office. Absolutely. Correct? And yes. I am so pleased to see members of City Council here. I'm wondering, is anybody from the Mayor's Office here today? Okay. Well, okay. So it's good to see where the, I mean, you know, it, it, that's sort of interesting. Um, <laughs> marginally. Um, <laughs> I wonder what all of you, uh, being in the media, of course, I, I am concerned all the time with coverage. And um, I've noticed, I don't see how anyone who's interested in this topic couldn't notice it, the uh, varying degrees of accuracy in media coverage and sensitivity in media coverage. Um, uh, Sherrod and I, in, I think it was November, 
Nicole, is that was that when we had the the ceremony for the um, all the transgender people who have been killed just last year, uh, which was very sobering. It was cardboard tombstones, dozens upon dozens of them at Trinity Cathedral, and that was a very sobering visual. And it made me ever mindful of how media coverage can play into that, or it can help sensitize uh, a public that needs educated. I'm wondering what advice you would give if you have an opinion on media coverage, first of all, and what counsel would you give to journalists who are covering this? Because I think we have a lot of growing to do in this area. Um, when, if you're referring to how they cover when someone's murdered or something, is what you're talking about? Like I for think the trans, it, I, like I, for Transgender Day of Remembrance? I guess that's the, what, where we most often When you're see talking the about like for Transgender Day of Remembrance, which you guys were there, yeah. um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's horrifying when they publicize something and they misgender someone and they ho horribly label something, you know, an, you know, an oddly dressed male wearing women's clothing. That's obviously a transgendered individual. It's, it's just a blatant disrespect to the individual. And it's nothing more than to sensationalize to sell papers or to, you know, to get media attention. And all it does is bring negative attention to the transgender community and give people the, it, it, it makes people feel that they can disrespect me and other transgender people. You know, being a, having spent a lot of years in a newsroom, my impression was, in, to some extent, confusion among reporters. And I was looking at one of the websites, I think GLAD's website uh, has some good tips, but the idea is to interview people who knew the victim, right? And that right. helps you to understand how that, maybe, how that, but if you don't have supportive family or friends, you don't get that. But what else would you advise? How do we know when, I mean, these are horrible stories to begin with, let's be honest. And, um, and certainly there'll be stories that don't involve murders. I mean, Cincinnati uh, Inquirer ran a wonderful story this past weekend with striking video of a transgender child and the support of family around her. It was really something. Um, what other advice would you give us? How do we discern this? How do we get better at this? Um, I, think that, I think that discernment comes with uh, experience and with the doing over and over and over again. I think the problem, mm -hmm. the problem right now is that we're in this um, growing stage, right? So we're, we're experiencing a lot of growing pains yes. around um, misgendering and use of names and, and things of that nature. So I think that it, I think that it's important for, for the media and for the consumers of media to understand that sometimes it's obvious when there is a blatant disregard for someone's trans status, sometimes mistakes are made. Like for, for example, uh, if, uh, if someone, uh, if someone, if a trans person has been killed or dies and does not have supportive family members, then that person will probably m be misgendered in, in the media. And I think that it's, it's up to us as, as um, trans people and non-trans consumers of media to be able to make the difference and or, or to be able to tell the difference. And when there is blatant disregard for someone's trans status to say something about it. But to not get up in arms about something that is, is, for lack of a better term, an innocent mistake. You know what I'm wondering as I'm listening to the two of you is you, you talk about a supportive family, you talk about family concerned about your four-year-old. I mean, there's all this other stuff you're already dealing with, right? When you're, and then we're asking you to be activists and advocates <laughs> as well. And I wonder, if there, I wonder how you deal with that. I mean, I, I would imagine that it can get, speaking from experience in a different field, sometimes a bit tiresome to always feel the need to be the spokesperson as well. But, but you end up absorbing that, I suppose. But I'm wondering how you, you two feel about that. Somebody has to do it. For myself, when I first, August of 2004, I went to my first transgender support group. I, my goal was I was gonna transition and I was just gonna walk about my life and I never thought I was gonna go back to another support group 
and I would never do what I'm doing. What changed? I saw what others did for me. And the first time... I'm sorry. The, the first time you have a 14-year-old kid come up and hug you and tell you thank you for what you've done for them, and you realize that all you did was let them know there's other people just like you and that their life will get better and that there's another day and it's going to be okay and you won't turn your back on them because maybe their parents not understanding or their schools not understanding or whatever it may be and you won't turn your back. You can't. Um, my husband, um, actually at the same Transgender Day of Remembrance that you and your husband were at, said to me, this 16-year-old uh, young man from one of the support groups I go to came up and just buried himself into me and was like so happy to see me. And he looked it right at me and said, and now I know why you do it. Oh. Well, I'm a ridiculous moderator because I keep tearing up and now I can't see what I'm supposed to be reading for the announcement part. Okay, um, so we, we're going to break for just a moment. This is really something. Um, we're going to break so I can do some announcements. It, you, if the regulars here already know how, how this goes. Uh, and the rest of you are for the most boring part of the program, but sorry. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are enjoying a panel discussion about transgender identity in Northeast Ohio. With us are Susan J. Becker of Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University and a volunteer lawyer with the ACLU, Dr. Henry Ng, Clinical Director of the Pride Clinic at Metro Health, transgender activist Stacy Parsons, and Darius Stubbs of Cleveland Public Theater. We are about to head into our Q&A, and we encourage you to think, about, think now about your questions for our panelists. We invite you to tune in to our Friday forums on 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and the country that carry the Cleveland City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our community partners for today's program are Equality Ohio and the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. We thank you for your support. We welcome guests at tables hosted today by several community organizations and local companies. Please check your printed program for a complete list. I know you're doing that right now, check. And we thank you all for your support. Be sure to join us on Friday, March 6th at noon as we welcome Evan Wolfson, founder and president of Freedom to Marry, for a discussion on the historical, political, and social evolution of marriage equality in the United States. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Now, we return to our panelists for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Please do not be afraid to ask questions. Good intentions rescue even the most muddled of language, and this is a chance for all of us to learn. Holding the microphone today is Administrative Assistant Jackie Powali and Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. First question, please. Um, I want to, I, I have to acknowledge the city council members, the city, Cleveland city council members who are here. So Councilwoman Mitchell, Councilwoman Cleveland, Councilman Simperman, and um, Councilman Johnson are here. Um, so I wanted to thank them for being here. And my question is for Darius and Stacy. What does it mean to you to have elected officials who either um, are quietly supportive or publicly supportive? What does that mean to you to, around elected officials and their support? Um, it's immense. Um, public policy helps, helps change the city on a legislative level. And I think that if changes are made there, then people kind of have to ev evaluate where they stand personally. So I think that it's, it's absolutely immense. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Darius said it. I mean, that's without without your support, nothing can change. And your being here says so much to the community. So I really appreciate your presence. Hi, thank you so much. I wanted to find out uh, if you could talk for a minute about what you have experienced with the healthcare community and if you were going to say one thing that's the most important to you in receiving health care, if you could talk about that as well. Thank you. Um, I would like to speak. Um, unfortunately, the healthcare community has not all been educated completely. I actually do speak at different venues, um, including medical universities, to try to help educate them. Um, I actually have had really some positive and some negative experiences dealing with medical community. Um, I've had physicians look right at me and tell me they don't want to deal with me and they will treat me like any normal man. If that is not the most dehumanizing thing to be told, um, when you're in pain and you need care, and then you're being told this right before they're going to put the IV in your arm and knock you out. But you decide that you just have to do it. But I've also had great care from other physicians. Um, I also, I always tell people, if you are going to deal with medical community, that if you have a physician that is willing to ask questions, take the time and speak with them. Because many of physicians, it's lack of education. They don't have any knowledge. A lot of them have never dealt with transgender patients. So I always try to take that time and help educate them if they've never had that experience. Darius, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, I just have a little personal anecdote to, to add to what Stacy was saying. Um, when I started my uh, transitions, my hormonal transition, I actually had to start twice. Um, because the first doctor that I was seeing, uh, I had seen him for three months, and then some of his other patients found out that he was treating transgendered people, and so, um, he sent a letter out to all of his transgender patients and said, I'm sorry, I can't treat you anymore because if I do, I will lose the rest of my clientele. Good luck to you. Wow. See ya. No, no, um, no recommendation on who else you could go see, how you could continue your transition, <laughs> nothing. Um, so there are, there are still doctors who require um, uh, education around the issue of um, transgender health and actually Cleveland has um, a really amazing um, jewel in the the uh, public health department in Dr. Ng yes. who is actually <laughs> who is actually um, really on the forefront of helping to educate other medical professionals about their transgender patients. Henry, can you please speak to it a bit too, because you're the one, and how often are you educating fellow doctors? Every day. Oh. <laughs> and I, I'm, not, I'm not joking as no, I say no. that, each and every single moment is a teaching experience, whether we're talking about someone who's coming in for a routine cold or a physical examination, or in my primary care practice where up to two thirds of my patients on a given day are trans, wow. out in the burps, during the light of day. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. But I, actually, I would say, you know, just like any other clinician who would provide care, especially to the previous doctor who denied you care or would send you away, I'd be thrilled to take care of you because guess what? I, I'm happy to take your business. <laughs> but the, the, the truth of the matter is that medical education, nursing education, social work education, health provider education is severely lacking. Um, in, for medical students alone, there's only five hours median time spent in five, four years of education on LGBT, and T is usually the smallest amount. So, wait, five hours in a how many years program? Four years. 
So that, that is the median amount of time in medical education in the United States. It is clear why there is an education gap. The content is missing, the time is missing. Programs like ours and other uh, around the country, as well as or the organization Glamma that I, I lead, we're providing opportunities for webinars, educational tools, and I encourage all of you to potentially check out our website at glamma.org and become a member, but also more importantly, find out what the tools are that are available. Tell your friends about them, tell your colleagues about them, share them with a health professional who cares, and you'll be able to improve the health of someone that you don't know about. Excellent, thank you. Next question. Over here. Hello, how are you? Uh, Daria, Stacy, thank you both very much for um, your courage today, sharing your personal stories, um, taking risk. Um, you're a voice for many, so Stacy in particular, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your life as a friend and, and many uh, of my transgender friends here in the room. Uh, thank you for educating me. My question is, I, I have a headline here from November uh, of uh, 2014 from Northeast Ohio Media Group that says Cleveland's transgender friendly legislation would open all public restrooms and showers to both sexes. So this goes back to the media coverage and inflammatory language that would insinuate and caused a huge public debate about, you know, the assumption would now me as a man I would be able to go to a women's room, you know, and this was the debate going on all online, all that, you know. So can you guys talk a little about how, you know, in order to get these ordinances passed in the city of Cleveland, we need education. We need people to understand that I'm not going to go in a women's room, okay? And there's already laws in place to protect anybody going to a bathroom. There's social norms, you know, there's there's behavior in a bathroom that is expected from anybody, but your right to use the bathroom that you identify with, with your gender, you know, how can we get this passed in Cleveland? How that can we have this question. in Northeast Ohio? And I would just like to add that um, the, I've never heard anybody so generously describe the comment section on Cleveland.com as a debate. So bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that headline is obviously inflammatory and, and really, really what it comes down to is, um, it's kind of playing on, on the, um, the social temperature, right? Um, cause really, really if, if you identified as female, and but this is and this is the way that you decided to express your your gender was dressing the way that you were but you felt more comfortable going into a women's restroom chances are you're going to go into the women's restroom for the same reason that a woman goes into the women's restroom right which is not to bother anyone right and i think that i think that that's where the misunderstanding is it's like well if someone who's male comes in the women's bathroom then he's going to do something bad Right, but if someone who's male goes into a woman's bathroom, chances are he's going in there to use the restroom. Um, it's like my father told me a story about um, they went to see a concert. Uh, he and my uh, my stepmother went to go see a concert. Okay, and um, uh, uh, he and um, were you with Uncle? Who were you with? with, with uh, the work. Right, so he was with some friends, and he and it's after the concert, and he and his friend are going into the bath. They go into the men's bathroom. There's no line. Right, they're going in the bathroom. They do their business. My stepmom and her friend are standing in a line that's like all the way down the hall and around the corner. So they're like, come, come, in the, come in the bathroom. So they grab them and they go in the bathroom. They stand in front of the stall. They go to the bathroom. And, and society didn't crumble. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so... So really, I feel like headlines like that play upon this this very idea when you think of a transgender woman do you think of her as a woman do you really think of her as a woman when you see or think of a transgender male do you really see him as a man and if you don't that's a personal issue 
Personal prejudice cannot dictate what happens in society at large. I mean, I'd like to comment. The, the restroom issue is we're going into the bathroom to go to the bathroom. I, what is the issue? I mean, I'm not going in the bathroom to do anything other than go to the bathroom. So what does it matter? I mean, Susan, you wanted to add yeah, something. Just, I think you characterized the whole thing very well, but what has happened with the media coverage is instead of taking an anti-discrimination ordinance and talking about discrimination and the people it's supposed to protect, the ordinance became, it was somehow transformed into an all-purpose bathroom, bathroom regulation. And that's just not what it's supposed to do. There's all kinds of other laws that deal with you know, conduct once you're in a restroom. And if you go into a restroom or any facility with the intent to harm or to engage in voyeuristic activities right. or inappropriate sexual activities, there are a lot of laws that protect that, but it isn't this ordinance. And that's what the confusion has been, and the media played a big part in conflating those two things. Just wait. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Raymond Bobkin. I'm the Executive Artistic Director at Cleveland Public Theater. We're the other employer. The other, yeah. These, <laughs> they're not the ones I'm afraid of. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just uh, so honored to work with Darius and, and Thank you so much for uh, your bravery here. Um, this is, represents a really, um, I think, interesting transition for you right now, um, because from a public viewpoint, you're transitioning from being a um, man to being a trans man. And, and I just wonder what, what um, that's like for you, because we worked together for many years, um, and only recently did, did I know. Um, so I'm just wondering how that's working for you and what um, people can do to be supportive of that. Um, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Uh, so I started my transition when I was in college in Alabama. Um, and so uh, when I came to Cleveland in 2006, I had already I had already been on hormones for about a year, and so I didn't, I didn't feel like it was necessary to divulge my trans status because um, there was very little possibility that anyone was going to question me about that. So I, I did what's um, called being stealth. I basically told no one about my trans status and let everyone assume that I was biolog biologically male because that's what just was going to happen. And so the original decision felt like a good decision because it, it felt like it kept me safe. I was putting up this barrier so that I wasn't able, I, I, it, made it, it made it harder for anyone to, to hurt me or, or um, question my masculinity because of my trans status. And actually, um, I feel like that barrier has kept me from making connections to people that are vital for me and, and for them, uh, especially with these people sitting at this table over here, uh, who I've, uh, who I've, uh, especially Raymond and Chris, who I have uh, not only created these um, uh, professional and artistic connections to, but have also become part of my family of choice and and so I, I was never so aware um, how isolating that fear of divulging my trans status was until I had been in Cleveland for nine years and I had made these, these connections and developed these relationships. And so to answer your question, I think that my transition from male to transgender male is a movement like this, right? And so it's, it's going to help me to become more vulnerable, which is necessary in developing relationship. And it will help me to be more accepting of myself and the people who are in my life. I 
I would like to know um, if you guys know what's being done for the transgender and uh, youth and adults in the system as far as rights to take hormones in the country, uh, in county or foster care. In county or foster care. Okay. Wow, so I guess not enough. No. It sounds like that's a pretty confounding issue at the moment. Yeah. I would not know. Do you know anything, Susan? No, I, I know it's obviously extremely controversial. You know, right. whenever you take someone and you take them away, for example, people in prisons, it's very uh, state to state. It differs as to whether someone can, especially if they've started hormone uh, therapy or any other kind of therapy, whether they can continue it or whether they're allowed to it. And those battles are being fought right now, and I don't know where we are in Ohio with it. I don't think it's come to the fore as of yet. That's a very important question you asked. Important. Henry, is that debate, are you, do you know much about that discussion going on here in the state? Not at the state level. I know that at the national level, there are organizations like the National Coalition for Transgender um, Equality and, and, and whatnot who are looking at these types of issues um, for youth who are in uh, the uh, juvenile justice system as well as other individuals in the correction system, but I'm not aware of where our status is currently for Ohio. I should say, I do know it is a problem here. I certainly have heard reports here, but in terms of finding the law that you could base an argument on about entitlement or right, or you know, for someone else to come in and take over whatever process the, uh, the county is using at this point, it's, it's very difficult to, to find a legal argument to move in uh, to that territory, but we'll, we'll, work, we'll work on it. Here's our next question. Right here. Um, first of all, I'm very proud to be part of your community. Thank you so much for, for doing what you're doing today. Um, my question is to, to Darius. Darius, as a person of color, hmm. how difficult has it been for you in your transition? Oh, boy. Um, so I think that uh, I think that it's been it's been difficult because I've I've become very aware of how differently black men are treated in uh, our society in general. Um, before I transitioned, I was, you know, I was perceived as being a masculine female, uh, which is much less threatening than uh, a black man in um, in Ohio and in the country. So, I've just been very it's been very interesting it's been a really interesting social experiment for me because um, that also I'm just very to be your life <laughs> yes, right. um, I'm just very aware of the um, the palpable fear that comes from people when they are trying to engage a man of color especially in the circles that I am in you know where I'm in um, the theater world and I'm in theater with uh, uh, device theater, which there aren't a lot of black people, and a lot of I, I, inter I interact with a lot of white people, and I inter interact with a lot of white females, and so there's this immediate feeling of you are a predator, you are a predator, you are a predator, you are a predator, that comes off of people when you interact with them, and so I feel like, um, <laughs> in addition to having to be, you know, a spokesperson for transgender people, I'm also having to be this example, which is kind of stressful, um, this example of a way in which a male can be black, right? Because there are, it seems like you're, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> um, you're interacted with as if you are a uh, potential thug or a potential buffoon or a uh, potential sexual fetish. And so, uh, I was never I was never aware of that until I um, became an adult in my transition. So it's something that I'm still still having to to deal with and find the way to. I don't know, <laughs> whatever that means. I'm liking the moves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where's our next question? Back. Okay. I have a daughter who's a lesbian married to a transgender man. I have asked him this question. I ask it of at least the two of you, if not in a broader spectrum. We talk about coming from being a man to a trans man. Why is that necessary? I don't even have a vision of my son-in-law as a woman. 
he's a man. And, and, and why does he need to be a trans man? Why can't he just identify as a man and go through life that way and, and comfortably? So I, I, I ask that as a kind of a philosophical question. If I believe, and I do, that the transition, he is a man, why does he need to be a trans man, except for teaching purposes? I'll exclude teaching purposes as, as necessary. I feel that the reason we, I, I will always be a trans woman because society constantly reminds me every day that I'm a trans woman because there's still an issue with me using public bathrooms. There's still an issue that I can't be legally married to my husband in Ohio. There's still an issue that I go to a health care provider and it's still an issue they're standing out in the hallway going, it's really a guy. That's why I'm still a trans woman. And uh, I think that that, I think that that's why um, no one, and no one has to identify anyway, right? It's important for people, especially people who don't have an issue passing, to be vocal about their trans status, to help support other people who may not be having as swell of a time, right? And if if, if uh, there are there are people on on. In many, in many ways that are dealing with their transgender status, some people have a harder time of it because of the way they look, because of the way they're built, because of the way their voice sounds. And I think that it's important for trans people who are not having those specific issues to be vocal about who they are until, until people think of people more the way you do. When people see people as people, and don't feel the need to put them into smaller and smaller and smaller boxes until I know exactly what you are, then people who are transgender will always, there always have to be someone who is willing to say, this is who I am, and this is why it's important, and this is why these people matter. That's a great question. That's a really great question. We have a, oh, over here, got it. Hi, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the bathrooms ordinance and bathrooms in general, if I could. Um, you've done a great job of, I think, dispelling some of the um, misinformation out there about bathrooms. And um, I know a lot of people um, worry about the safety of the people that are in the bathroom uh, with a transgender person. And I think you cleared that up really well, just saying we're there to go to the bathroom just like anyone else. Um, but uh, I've heard a lot about, um, I mean, I'm having a lot of tra uh, transgender friends, I'm more worried about the safety of um, of my friends who are transgender in those restrooms. And I'm wondering if you could just um, talk a little bit about um, your experience using restrooms, your experience with safety in restrooms, and just um, uh, talk about that for a second. That is a Thanks. great question, and um, it'll be our last one. So if you two would address what he said, and then if you two could get, offer tips for safety. And how did I think that would so if you could think about that a little bit while we have you two answer? Um, my former employer, no, I said former employer, <laughs> forced me to use the men's bathroom presenting the way I look now. Um, while I wasn't so uncomfortable going in the bathroom with the male employees that I worked with for 11 years because I knew them very well and I wasn't afraid of those men. I was uncomfortable because I didn't feel comfortable going in the men's restroom. But it was a little scary going in that men's room and coming out of a stall and not knowing who I was going to run into. Um, one example, I was in there and a gentleman, I had, was on the tow motor, I unloaded in his truck and at the time I had my hair dyed pretty red and he told me I looked like Bonona Judd, and, he and I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> About a week or two later, I come out of the stall, and he's at the urinal. And he was quite upset. And he threw quite a fit that he had flirted with me. I didn't ask wow. him to make comments that I looked like Winona Judd to him. Yeah. But that put me at such a risk 
And I tried explaining to my plant manager, I said to him, are you going to explain to my son why his father was killed? I only want to use the bathroom. It was my safety that I was worried about. That's the only reason I wanted to use the women's bathroom. Other than that's where I belong. Darius, but, what about you? Um, I tend to not go into public restrooms only because uh, it, I don't know. I think it's the perception of why is the guy going into the stall? Why isn't he using the urinal? Um, when, I was, when I was in college, I knew where the two, the two single ocup occupying stalls were on campus. There were only two. I knew exactly where they were. One was in the, the basement of the history building. One was in the basement of the science building. Those were the only bathrooms that I went to because I didn't want to have a situation happen where I had to defend myself in a restroom. Um, so I think, I think that the, the violence that faces transgender people without this ordinance being passed is much more is much more imminent than any backlash that might happen after the ordinance is passed I am frankly so sorry that we are out of time uh, I wish we weren't because I would love to have heard those tips but we will the, the conversation continues that is the point of this room today Today at the City Club, we have enjoyed a panel discussion titled Towards Full Equality, Transgender Identity in, North, excuse me, in Northeast Ohio. Thank you to our panelists. What an incredible panel. for proving that we were exactly right to be doing this in Cleveland and Malfrop. Thank you.